Leprosy is a serious infectious disease. It's even mentioned in the Old Testament. In those days, people believed that the cause of leprosy was God venting his wrath on sinners. In the Middle Ages, major epidemics decimated entire regions of Europe, claiming millions of lives in only a few years. Physicians invented their own ways of protecting themselves from the plague. In addition to the plague, it was mainly anthrax and tuberculosis that were the killers. No one knew what caused these diseases. Girolamo Fracastoro, a physician from Verona, put forward a hypothesis which for the time was rather unusual. Fracastoro believed the diseases were caused by tiny organisms, although he was unable to prove this. It was only with the invention of the microscope that a totally new and wondrous world was opened up to man. One of the first to use a microscope was Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a draper and haberdasher in the Dutch town of Delft, who was also a keen amateur scientist. No matter what substance he studied through his simple microscope, van Leeuwenhoek always came across tiny creatures in it. Even a drop of pond water provided an impressive spectacle. It was teeming with thousands of minute organisms. Van Leeuwenhoek was also the first man to describe bacteria. He'd seen them in the film on his own teeth. In the years that followed, the microscope became increasingly popular, especially as a form of amusement for the upper class. But no major scientific breakthroughs were achieved with it. Very few scientists suspected the true significance for man of the strange minute organisms. One who did was German physician Athanasius Kircher, who believed that they were the cause of the plague. Other scientists went even further. They suspected that germs were to be found in the air, in water, in wine, as well as in urine, in blood, and in the pustules of smallpox victims. But where did they come from? At the time, science believed in spontaneous generation, the origination of living organisms from lifeless matter, a theory which prevailed right through to the mid-19th century. It was French chemist Louis Pasteur who exploded the theory. Pasteur attracted attention when he saved a distiller in Lille from bankruptcy. The fermentation of beet sugar was proving a problem and the distillery was making a loss day after day. Instead of alcohol, the end product was often a sour smelling brew. No one knew why and Pasteur, a professor of chemistry, was asked to help. At the time, he knew no more than any other scientist, but he agreed to examine the pungent liquid under a microscope. Pasteur discovered the process was going wrong because of the presence of rod-like microorganisms, lactic acid bacteria. In 1857, Pasteur was appointed director of scientific studies at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Now he could devote all his attentions to studying microorganisms. Pasteur proved that germs are spread in the air. The Special Commission acknowledged the results of Pasteur's experiments. It was the death knell for the theory of spontaneous generation. In his home region, Pasteur combated the diseases that affect wine with a process in which germs are killed off by being briefly exposed to heat. This process became known as pasteurization. The whole of France was talking about Bacilli, even the emperor, Napoleon III. In 1865, the Parisian world of fashion was in a state of turmoil. The silk industry of southern France was threatened by a puzzling disease that was killing off large numbers of silkworms. Together with his assistant, Emile Dugot, Pasteur began to study the diseases affecting silkworms. Once again, he came across bacteria. Later, Pasteur discovered that chickens he'd inoculated with a weakened form of the germ that causes chicken cholera were immune to a fresh attack. Pasteur used a similar approach to try and find a vaccine for rabies. He infected rabbits with bacteria taken from a rabid dog and then removed their bone marrow. By drying the samples of marrow, 
Pasteur obtained the vaccine he wanted. When he injected another rabid dog with the vaccine, Pasteur found it cured the animal and made it immune to the disease. On July the 6th, 1885, nine-year-old Joseph Meister was taken by his mother to Pasteur's laboratory. Two days previously, the boy had been bitten several times by a rabid dog. Pasteur injected the boy with the oldest rabbit bone marrow. Every day, Joseph was treated with an increasingly younger and thus more virulent form of the virus, a total of 12 times over a period of 10 days. The first rabies vaccination performed on a human being was a complete success. Three years later, the Pasteur Institute was inaugurated in Paris. It's still one of the finest research institutes in the world even today. Although in failing health, Louis Pasteur headed the institute until his death on September the 28th, 1895. He was 73. At the time Louis Pasteur was studying infected silkworms, at the General Hospital in Hamburg, a young houseman called Robert Koch was about to move on. After several unsuccessful attempts to establish himself as a doctor, Koch became district surgeon in Wolstein. There he built a small laboratory and, amongst other things, began to study anthrax. In the blood of sheep infected with anthrax, Koch noticed tiny rod-like organisms barely a thousandth of a millimetre long. Koch injected healthy mice with this infected blood. The mice became ill and died with the typical symptoms of anthrax. Koch again detected the rod-like organisms in their blood. Koch's method for identifying a pathogen as the cause of a certain disease was perfect. He removed tissue samples and blood from sick animals. In every case, he was able to identify the pathogen, rod-like bacteria. By transferring the bacteria to a nutrient medium, Koch was able to isolate the bacteria and breed them in pure cultures. To this end, he developed special techniques and nutrient media. Injected into a healthy test animal, the bacteria produced the typical symptoms of anthrax. And once again, Koch identified rod-like microorganisms in the sick animals. And it's these bacteria Koch had proved that cause anthrax. Anthrax bacteria are also able to form resistant spores. In this way, they can survive for many years outside an organism. The spores then get into an animal's body through the air or in food and develop into lethal bacteria. Thus, Koch had also explained how anthrax is spread. In 1880, Koch became director of the German health office in Berlin, which had been founded four years previously. Here, he found better conditions for his bacteriological research. In Berlin, he concentrated on a disease which at the time was responsible for one death in every seven, tuberculosis. No one knew what caused tuberculosis. Doctors were powerless, their attempts to treat the disease at best curious. Some believed that electricity would help, while others placed their faith in injections of animal blood. Tuberculosis was rife mainly in the dark basement apartments of the working class where hygienic conditions were poor. But the disease also attacked members of other social classes. Those wealthy enough tried to find a cure in a sanatorium sunbathing and breast cures provided little help. Then, in 1882, Robert Koch made a sensational announcement. He had discovered the pathogen that causes tuberculosis. Koch had proved that tuberculosis is an infectious disease that is caused and transmitted by bacteria. In the tropics, new tasks awaited Koch. From India, where it's endemic, cholera had already spread as far as Egypt. Koch travelled first to Alexandria and then on to India and the Ganges Delta. In 1893, he discovered the pathogen that causes cholera. In South Africa, in the British Cape Colony, he studied rinderpest. Back 
Like in India, he turned his attentions to the dreaded bubonic plague. In German East Africa, present-day Tanzania, Koch studied sleeping sickness, Texas fever and malaria. For a long time, his method of keeping malaria under control remained the only satisfactory approach. It was only after the Second World War that the insecticide, DDT, became available. Finally, his research into malaria took Koch to New Guinea. But Robert Koch also experienced setbacks. The agent he had developed against tuberculosis, tuberculin, proved ineffective. His hopes of finally having found a cure were shattered. Koch never really got over this failure. But tuberculin did prove its value as a means of diagnosing tuberculosis. On December the 12th, 1905, the day after his birthday, Robert Koch received the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his tuberculosis research. Robert Koch died on May the 27th, 1910. He was 76. Thanks to the bacteriological methods developed by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, one new disease-causing agent after another was discovered. Now it was possible to take preventive steps. Hygienic conditions were improved, vaccines developed. In addition to those antibiotics which occur naturally, research also took place into semi-synthetic drugs. For a while it was thought that the most dangerous infectious diseases were as good as beaten, at least in the industrial countries. It seemed merely a question of time before the last few diseases would be eliminated with new drugs. Yet the confidence shown by bacteriologists soon began to wane. Despite major efforts, they couldn't even find a vaccine against the common cold, which is caused by viruses nor have they been able to combat the virus that causes AIDS. Today, AIDS poses a threat similar to that once posed by the great epidemics, the plague, smallpox and cholera. AIDS affects people of all races and all social strata. Research institutes the world over are trying to solve the problem. So far, science has only identified the pathogen. It has not yet come up with an effective cure. are even arising with regard to the classic bacterial infectious diseases. The pathogens are becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics. Diseases that were once thought to have died out are now reoccurring with increasing frequency. In the less developed countries, the classic infectious diseases, tuberculosis, pneumonia, measles, malaria and tetanus still claim millions of lives every year. It's doubtful whether we will ever have a world free of infectious disease. Man will always be locked in battle with microorganisms whose ability to mutate poses a constant challenge. Consequently, the inventiveness of physicians, biologists and bacteriologists is permanently being put to the test. The fundamentals in the fight against disease were established by two men, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, the pioneers of bacteriology.